what were we trying to do in setting up Black Audio Film Collective is the question. One has ambitions, cultural, political, aesthetic ambitions. Um, but I think on the whole what tends to happen with collectives uh, or, or, or manifestos around which a group of people are trying to work is this. You set off with a set of ambitions and then in the process of trying to implement those ambitions other things get in the way. The, the, the other unfinished conversations basically. And that then forces you to, to assess and reassess the original position. So one of the things we certainly wanted to do um, as, a, as a, a group of disparate individuals and artists was to find out quite literally whether it was possible to have a collective practice. And that was one ambition. Can a group of, of artists from a range of backgrounds with a range of interests come to share a platform that they all agree with which can provide a way of making radical work? Is that possible? Um, the second was, could you bring people from across a range of disciplines, uh, some from psychology, the humanities, the art world, you know, could you bring a range of disciplines together to formulate that collective practice? And thirdly, if that collective practice was made up of disparate individuals from a range of disciplines, um, could the work that they do also be like discursive, for want of a better word. So those were the three broad ambitions, and this was separate from what it was that we were going to do <laughs> once we got those things together. Um, and I think in the, the, a lot of time uh, in the very early uh, years, between I'd say 82 and 85, were taken up with trying to figure out, having put those three things in place, what they were in place for. So you've got a group of artists, they're working collectively, they from a range of backgrounds, and they share these back political and cultural and aesthetic ambitions. What is that for? <laughs> and uh, that's where I think the, the sort of conversation with the outside world starts. Because in order to understand how the practice then evolved, you need to know something about England in the 1780s. We were, in effect, the first post-war generation um, to grow up and come of age, hit voting age, in the late 60s, early 70s in this country. And it seemed to us at the time that that placed certain historic responsibilities on you. One of which was to make sense of yourself culturally and politically, and by implication, make sense to the broader culture. Um, it felt as if uh, the question of representation, broadly put, aesthetic, political and cultural, needed to be put on the agenda. We have to have forms of political representation that legitimated our lives. But that was something that couldn't happen on its own. Um, if you want to be represented, you have to then formulate ways in which you think that representation could take in iconic terms, you know, who are you? <laughs> you know, it's all very well saying, I want to be represented, but who the fuck are you? Um, and trying to figure out who we were, trying to, if you like, provide the counter narratives, um, be they figurative, uh, sonic, or aesthetic uh, narratives, were an important part of the project of representation, you know. Um, so we saw our role, um, and I think in that sense we weren't that different from a range of, of other artists and, and activists working in the 70s and 80s. We saw our role as one of putting on the table a number of questions which were to do with identity, which were to do with cultural representation, which were to do with alternative cultural and aesthetic practices that might find a, a way of legitimizing black identities in this country, you know, which might find a way of, of saying, okay, um, this is what we mean when we say black British identity. You know, these are its cultural components. 
these are some of the aesthetic ambitions that somebody who is black and British might have. You know, it was, um, it was roughly that. And then from that point onwards, it was like riding a wild horse. You just, you know, because <laughs> the minute you jump into something, the thing then says to you, oh, I see, so, so you, think you're, you think you're up for this, huh? <laughs> Let's just see. Um, it was, it was, you know, it was just a, a, a roller coaster of a ride. I mean, you know, and, and I don't mean that in any kind of dramatic way. Look, for instance, um, I mean, I didn't know that there were going to be riots in 1985 across England. Britain, in fact. None of us knew that. <laughs> you know, they happened, and then the question was, would you like to do something about it? And it's that kind of roller coaster, you know. Um, and when you decide you're going to do something about it, the question that you ask yourself is this, you know, this is, this is what newspapers are saying, this is what the political class is saying, this is what the mainstream television stations are saying, and this is almost certainly what you hear around you in the society. Does any of that chime with what you feel or believe? And if it doesn't, how do you begin to find a way of saying something that's different in both qualitative and quantitative terms? I mean, just how do you say something different? I mean, it's a big problem for most of us <laughs> anyway. But I think if you decide that you're going to formulate a new aesthetic regime, the question of saying something new is a really huge problem. Um, so, uh, so much of our early years were spent pondering these questions, very much in that kind of artist, in the Garrett way, you know, it's like, this is working, <laughs> really. But I think what helped us was um, the fact that you had a, a group of people around you that you were working with meant at any one time, someone could say to you, no, that's bollocks, mate. Yeah, that doesn't work. And if enough people said it, then you knew it was true. <laughs> do you know what I mean? So one of the things you had to do, every week we met to decide on what to work on. Um, and it, was, it would either be on something that was ongoing, let's say Hansworth Songs at Twilight City, um, or future work. Um, if it was future work, you had to propose an idea and you could usually tell when the idea had, had wings, you know, if one or two people said, hmm, yeah, then you knew you had a chance. <laughs> if you say something and the whole room went quiet, you, you knew. <laughs> it was, if you excuse the French, fucked. <laughs> because um, part of the project was to persuade each other to do things and if you can't because we felt like if you couldn't persuade seven other people there's very little chance of persuading anybody outside of the room <laughs> you know, if you can't get seven people to agree to watch something that you'd made then um, it wasn't worth it um, so a lot of the time was also taken up with trying to uh, convince ourselves that some directions were worth taking um, and we shelved more than we actually made. You know, everything that um, ended up being the finished work would have four or five versions that nobody ever saw, except us. That was Black Audio.